So it is August 31st, and today I'm going to talk about supporting people with cancer using plant medicine. And uh, this is a pretty expansive topic, and it's, uh, you know, because it's a serious illness, it is something that is pretty in-depth. Um, it's uh, not something that you can learn all about in a couple of hours. So what I'm going to do is give you a sort of overview of some of the important things to know about it so that you can learn more about it. Uh, some of the kind of general overview of the physiology of what's going on in a person who has cancer uh, and some of the things that herbalists do to help those people. And uh, just kind of uh, a basic, a basis in understanding some strategy, some clinical strategies, some uh, different roles that herbs can play for a person like that and the general physiology of what is going on with someone in that type of a situation. Uh, if you were to end up working with someone who does have that type of situation going on, who does have cancer, you know, feel free to reach out to me. It is definitely, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a more upper level kind of thing to deal with. And uh, it's something that, like I say about everything, that if you have a little bit of knowledge, you can help a little bit. And if you have a lot of knowledge, you can help quite a bit more. And uh, so I'm going to try and give you a little bit of knowledge about, about the subject and about some of the herbs that have been and are used for people uh, in that clinical scenario. So cancer uh, is sometimes talked about as though it were a particular disease, but it's really not. Cancer is a physiological process where abnormal cells are growing in the body at a rate faster than what it takes to reproduce themselves. So they tend to grow in population and also to spread to other areas in the body. Um, what those cells were before they became irregular cells is different depending on the area of the body where it starts out and uh that can uh that can be all kinds of different things and that can make a big difference also in what the cells respond to what they're vulnerable to and so forth for example um skin cancer typically starts out when cells on the skin have their dna damaged often by the sun, but not always. And they become an irregular type of cell, uh, something other than a normal human cell, skin cell, and start reproducing more quickly. Um, what exactly is meant by quickly is sort of a relative term, but it essentially means the, the cells on your skin normally reproduce fast enough to keep skin on you, even though it's constantly exfoliating, even though cells of your skin are constantly dying, they reproduce fast enough to maintain skin. Cancer cells reproduce faster than what it takes to maintain. With skin cells, they don't reproduce much faster. With most types of skin cancer, they don't reproduce much faster. With cancers that start out in glands, for instance, they often reproduce quite a bit faster and spread quickly, grow quickly and spread quickly. So the initial lesion, the initial neoplasm, which is meaning like new stuff, new substance, uh, but that's how people often refer to cancer in uh, in uh, more technical writing. The, the initial neoplasm will grow larger, faster, and then the... Uh, the cells might spread to other places in the body, which is called metastasis. So when something is metastatic, it means that it is not just in its original location, but in other locations as well. Uh, with cancers in the body, those locations typically start out as being either in tissue or in lymph nodes, in tissue that's adjacent to where the original growth is, 
and in lymph nodes that are nearby. And from there, it can spread to other things. So if someone gets, for example, prostate cancer, which is in the prostate gland at the base of the penis, that is a pretty common type of cancer. Um, a lot of the time, it does not spread very quickly. When it does spread, sometimes it spreads to the bone, which is uh, right next to it, the pubic bone. Sometimes it spreads to the lymph nodes that are nearby. Um, and from there, it can spread to other places in the body. Although with that particular type of cancer, it's usually slow growing, no guarantees, but usually slow growing. And there are a number of factors that determine how quickly cancers grow. And one of them is the type of cancer it is, the type of, when I say the type of cancer, that also, that includes both what the original tissue is that it is a mutation of and what that particular difference that it has is. So um, with prostate cancer, to stick with that example for the moment, most of the time we would call it an adenocarcinoma, which means that it is a, uh, a cancer made out of gland cells that have gone slightly wrong or that have gone somewhat wrong. Usually it's well differentiated. Well differentiated means that you can tell really easily what kind of cell it is. It doesn't look very different from the parent cell, the original cell. Um, some cancer is very poorly differentiated or very undifferentiated, meaning that it could be any kind of cell. It's more like a generic stem cell and those can spread more quickly. Uh, and they're also less particular in their needs for growth. And then with that particular cancer, again, it is often uh, accelerated in its growth by androgens, by testosterone and similar chemicals. So we would call that androgen sensitive, um, meaning that it, it responds to that type of uh, that type of hormone by growing more. So you, you get differences depending on what the initial type of tissue is, um, what, what uh, things it might be sensitive to or reactive to, and also how differentiated it is from the initial type of tissue that it started out as, or that it descended from is more like it. So, uh, so you get all of those factors playing a big role and between all of them there can be huge differences in uh progression and in outcomes uh generally speaking the slower growing a cancer type is the easier it is for it to be treated successfully the uh, the more differentiated it is, in other words, the, the closer it is to being a normal cell, the easier it is for it to be treated successfully. And the more things that it is sensitive or reactive to, the easier it is to work with. Um, so uh, with... Cancer diagnoses are typically made by biopsy. There are other ways to diagnose cancer, but a lot of the time what happens is somebody will notice something unusual, either pain in an area or a growth that feels that's a different shape or a lesion or something like that. And then it will get biopsied where a small piece of it is cut out, looked at under the microscope, sometimes subjected to some other tests. And that's usually how people come to a diagnosis. Uh, there are ways that uh, people can be pretty sure that something is cancer sometimes, but just by looking at it and so forth. But usually if you're working with somebody who has cancer, they will have received a diagnosis after having had uh, a lesion biopsy. And uh, typically with almost everybody that I work with using herbal medicine to help people who have cancer, they're almost always doing conventional uh, cancer treatments as well. The only real exceptions I would have to that are um, very self-limiting cancers like uh, squamous cell carcinoma on the skin, uh, which doesn't tend to spread very fast or be very dangerous um, to the extent that sometimes uh, people won't treat it because it's 
you know, treating it as carries some risks that it by itself does not really carry, especially in older people who is often who it shows up in. Or people who have previously been through cancer and don't want to go back through the conventional treatment, even though they know that the choice not to do so might greatly decrease their uh, chance of survival. So that that's uh, that's a scenario that I've seen sometimes, but almost everybody that I work with who has cancer, they're not just coming to me. They're coming to me. They're going to an oncologist. They're also often going to other people like faith healers or um, uh, acupuncturists or various other modalities. So, um, you know, that's and that's something that. Uh, this is important to be able to work with. Uh, I think that if any of those modalities were to say work with me and only with me, that they would be doing a great disservice to to the people that they're supposed to be helping. So um, when someone has cancer, a lot of the time it will be, uh, people will talk about it being in stages stages usually uh represent they're a little bit they're done a little bit differently for different types of cancer but usually it's like stage one through four uh with one meaning that it's localized um and four meaning that it's spread throughout the body and exactly what the intermediate stages are are different from one case to the next a little bit but it's often something like Stage two means that it's spread to one lymph node or an adjacent organ. And stage three means that it's spread to an organ that's not adjacent to it or to multiple lymph nodes. Uh, so that's uh, often, often how the staging is done, but it's different for different cancers. Uh, cancer can happen in pretty much any type of bodily tissue. Um, so, you know, you get... Uh, there, there are blood cancers and bone cancers and uh, lung cancer, uh, various different things. Uh, cancers that are in the inner organs of the abdomen, the liver and the pancreas, are nearly always fatal. Uh, they're, they're very, uh, the prognosis for them is very poor. Sometimes if they're at the very edge of one of those organs, they can be removed and the person maybe, you know, has... Uh, a longer life afterwards. But uh, most of the time, a lot of the time with pancreatic cancer, especially, and this is often true with liver cancer as well, people don't know it's there until it has grown to the point that it has irreparably disrupted things, uh, irreparably disrupted the functioning of a vital organ. So a lot of the time, those, those situations uh, are most of the time those situations are fatal that doesn't necessarily mean you can't still help the person though I, I i've worked with a lot of people who um knew that they had a limited amount of time but still wanted to have the best outcomes that they could during that time so a lot of the time you know we're not, we're not here to bestow earthly immortality we're here to give ease and we're here to uh make people's lives feel better and to be healthier within whatever boundaries are possible. Okay, so. So the conventional treatments that people are going through for cancer are often a big part of what you might be called upon to help them with, uh, to help them with the uh, negative outcomes that are associated with those types of treatments. So some of the treatments are surgery to remove affected tissue, radiation to destroy affected tissue, and um, cancer drugs, chemotherapy which also is intended to poison and destroy the affected tissues, uh, and but is also very toxic to the body in general. So 
all of those have their side effects. You know, surgeries have their uh, blood loss and scarring and pain and potential for infection and radiation uh, causes some other disruptions in the physiology, makes people more tired, causes burns, causes uh, um, sometimes causes just a general feeling of sickness afterwards. Uh, and then the drugs can cause all kinds of things. Uh, they can cause people's hairs to fall out. They can cause them to lose their appetite, sometimes to the point of becoming severely malnourished and dying from that. Sometimes, uh, uh, often they cause loss of sleep, um, disruptions of that sort. Uh, so, and yeah, um, depending on which drugs it is, they, they can cause all sorts of other uh, fallout within the body. But nausea and lack of appetite and pain are huge ones. Uh, and they're also ones that, that we can sometimes really help with using using herbal remedies. So kind of a grim topic, but uh, there are, uh, you know, it, it's definitely something that affects a lot of people at some point in their life. And it's uh, often something that people seek out alternative care for. So if you are getting to be known uh, in your social circles as an herbalist, there's a good chance that at some point someone's going to come to you and ask for help uh, dealing with this type of situation. Um, and one of the things that you need to do in that type of a scenario, uh, unfortunately, is you do have to help manage people's expectations. You know, somebody might come to you and say, you know, can you give me something that's going to make me feel all better? Can you give me something that's going to uh, detoxify me and remove all the cancer from my body? Something like that. And unfortunately, a lot of people have made claims to that effect uh, over the years. There have been a lot of spurious, uh, empty promises made about being able to treat cancer. And uh, while there are things that do help with it, you know, they're often like many other things, very oversold. So if people come to you asking about it, sometimes you have to say, um, you have to, you have to uh, help them to realize that you can help, but you cannot necessarily work miracles. Uh, so a lot of the time I will try and say to them, here's what I have. Here's what, what we can likely expect from it. You know, I, I can help you I can help to strengthen your immune system. I can help to um, relieve symptoms you might be experiencing like pain, sleeplessness, and lack of appetite. Um, and I can you know, try and create the best possible terrain to help your body fight off the cancer. But ultimately, there's still a struggle going on of your body trying to get rid of the cancer and the cancer trying to take over or trying to just, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a will to take over, but it has uh, a tendency to take over because it has the uh, um, propensity to just grow out of control and uh, thereby disrupt the functioning of whatever tissue it's growing in or next to. Uh, consuming resources and putting out waste products and not really contributing anything to uh, the intentional functioning of the body. So I want to talk about some of the general strategies that we might use as herbalists to do those things, to, to help a person who has cancer um, and some of the things, some of the different ways in which we might help them and some of the different uh, possible herbs and combinations of herbs that we might use in that type of a scenario. So one thing that is sometimes helpful is supporting the immune system. The uh, 
immune system will often fight against cancers, not necessarily um, because they are made out of your own bodily cells. The immune system sometimes ignores them and doesn't respond to them, especially right away. But uh, as they grow, sometimes the immune system is at least having some parts of the immune system are responding to it. And by not only strengthening, but stimulating the immune system is sometimes possible to get more of a response happening to areas where cancer is um, and get give the body more of the nutrients and resources it needs to mount an immune defense. When somebody's immune system kills off cancer and makes it go away, that's called a spontaneous remission. Uh, it sounds as though the cancer just decided on its own to go into remission, but that's not really what it means. It means that the body has successfully fought it off uh, in the absence of you know necessarily any other kind of treatment. So that is a thing that can happen. It's not a thing that can be relied upon, but it is an outcome sometimes. Uh, and, you know, I've definitely had people that I've worked with who started out by supporting their immune systems and uh, went into a spontaneous remission before they even got to the point of uh, starting any kind of conventional treatment. And I've also had people for whom the immune system never really seemed to mount much of a defense to the cancers. So, you know, there's a, there are all kinds of reasons why that happens or doesn't happen. And that's a pretty complicated situation, but essentially some of it is to do with the body recognizing that there is something to respond to. And some of it is uh, about that response being pronounced enough to, uh, uh, to keep well, not only to keep the cancer from growing, but to destroy it, uh, to destroy what's already there. So it should be noted in talking about that, that on a regular basis, there are occasionally irregular cells being produced in anybody's body that are being destroyed by the immune system. Uh, you know, a cell gets made wrong, the body uh, recognizes the proteins in it as not being the right proteins, and a macrophage comes along and destroys it. And rather than growing into a cancerous neoplasm, nothing happens and you never notice it. Uh, so that, that probably happens to people all the time. Um, and for some people, it might happen a lot more consistently. You know, some people, uh, some situations make people prone to cancer. Uh, some situations and some genetic makeups and so forth uh, might make people less likely to get cancer or more likely to be able to successfully stop it from stop it from getting started. So because of the way that cells reproduce, of course, you'll have a single cell dividing in two and those cells dividing in two again. So it has a sort of a snowball effect, an asymptotic growth where uh, two becomes four and then eight and then 16 and so on. And, uh, that can grow very quickly into, into uh, too much, into a significant enough group of cells that it's consuming a significant amount of resources, producing a significant amount of waste products, and also physically interrupting or disrupting the other tissues around it. So just, you know, creating the right conditions for that not to happen, for, for proper cell growth to happen is an important part of keeping the body healthy. Um, and I will talk more about that in, in a little bit here. But uh, strengthening the immune system is a, is a good first step. If somebody has recently received a cancer diagnosis and you're wanting to help them, um, it can be useful to give them some things that will help uh, to nourish and stimulate their immune system. In those, in that type of scenario, there's a few things that I really like for that, uh, that um, some of which come from the mushroom kingdom, uh, reishi, Ganoderma is a really good one. Tramedes is probably my favorite. Tramedes is turkey tail mushroom, which grows on rotting logs. 
Uh, it's very common in the woods of Kentucky uh, and in lots of other places. And uh, it contains, they all contain um, lots of uh, alpha and beta glucans, which are polysaccharides that help to stimulate the immune system. And they also contain some acids and some other things that have not necessarily been as well researched, but that do play a role in, in the medicinal properties of those mushrooms. Uh, so all of that is kind of just nourishing the immune system, uh, feeding the immune system so that it can do its job. Um, another herb that I like in this scenario is astragalus. Astragalus is... Uh, it's a member of the same plant family as beans and as licorice and as clover. And it tends to give a really good boost, a really good stimulation to the immune system and makes sometimes makes the immune system begin fighting against things that it was previously not mounting a defense against. So those are some of my initial things that I would be likely to give somebody who has just come to me, who has a new cancer uh, diagnosis, would be medicinal mushroom, a compound of medicinal mushrooms uh, that would contain some substances to strengthen and nurture the immune system, and astragalus, which uh, is more stimulating and kind of waking and moving the immune system. So that that is often a big part of it. And along with that, I'm trying to create a healthy terrain for a good physical defense of the body to happen. And so that for me means that it's a good idea to make sure the person is getting plenty of fluids, lots of nutrients, and that the organs of elimination are working really well. So doing something to strengthen and stimulate the kidneys, liver, and colon can be really helpful just in terms of uh, making the person feel better. And also uh, maybe if uh, there's often a sense that the cancer is producing waste products that are polluting the body, that the body has um, waste products being produced that might not be part of some of the feedback loops that normal tissue would be giving to those organs to work harder. So a lot of traditional remedies that have been used for people with cancer are ones that stimulate the organs of elimination. Uh, so things like uh, burdock and yellow dock and um, things like, uh, I like sumac really well for the kidneys because it's uh, it's an antioxidant as well as, uh, as well as diuretic. So those are important, but they are reliant for being a good thing on there being plenty of intake of fluids uh, because getting dehydrated is, is not something you want. So question saying, could reishi and or turkey tail be taken all the time as an immune tonic? Yes, they can be. And lots of people do take them all the time uh, as an immune tonic. So yes, that's definitely a thing that can safely be done. And that does, um, uh, that's reasonable to do all the time because the type of response that it's getting or the type of action that it's having on the body is mostly one of ongoing deep nourishment of the cells rather than stimulating a particular action to happen that would that would just happen and be done with. For those mushrooms, would you recommend someone who maybe is in remission take something like that constantly, even if they're in remission, just kind of as a tonic herb like that, just to kind of keep them that way. Yeah, would that be something? I would, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's a really good thing to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the traditional way of preparing those mushrooms is as a hot water extract. When I make them for my clinic, I also do have some alcohol in them as well so that they're shelf stable. Because like I said, I've said lots of times, you know, if you give somebody a remedy that they won't go to the trouble of preparing, it won't do them any good. So having it in a ready to use form on the shelf is important to me. Um, okay. 
so uh yeah that that is uh that's one first step a lot of people there are a lot of traditional not a lot there are some traditional formulas out there that people use for cancer like SEAC T for instance or like the Hoxie formula that that are multi-ingredient formulas that are often marketed as sort of a one size fits all miraculous cure for cancer. Um, but mostly what they are is things that uh, stimulate the organs of elimination. They're, they're cleansing, they're diuretic and laxative and cholagog. Um, and in some cases that might be enough to change the pH in the body and change the body chemistry in a way that disrupts uh, cancer all on its own. But uh, I don't, I don't know that that happens very often and it certainly isn't a strategy that can be relied upon to work. Uh, there are plenty of cases out there of people saying I did this and my cancer went away. Um, I have not personally talked to anyone like that. And I've talked to a lot of people who said, you know, okay, I was diagnosed with cancer and I've been doing SEAC T for seven weeks and I still have just as much cancer. What do I do next? So, you know, you, even though those things are sold as though they're, uh, you know, very effective for it, I would say that, that those cases are probably atypical. Uh, the cases in which they appear to make a, a huge difference are, are in my experience, probably quite atypical. Uh, not to say impossible or anything like that, but definitely not something you can just expect to happen. So, uh, but I do think that lots of hydration and lots of getting the body's organs of elimination to function well is really important. And in a lot of people who have cancer, uh, they don't function well because those organs tend to often decrease in functionality as we age and cancer is not always, but very frequently uh, happening in middle-aged and older people. Uh, you can get cancer at any age, but uh, certain cancers are more likely to happen at certain times of life. Um, some cancers that are fed by hormones that rely on hormones for them to grow, uh, like breast cancer, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, not all breast cancer, but a good bit of it. Um, uh, the, these things rely on some of those steroidal hormones that we talked about a few weeks ago being present in the body in order for them to, uh, to develop and to replicate. And uh, so they're more common during phases of life where people have more of those hormones. Um, and especially where people have had more exposure to those hormones. So for example, in an estrogen sensitive breast cancer, you wouldn't typically see that in a younger adult. Um, you, and you wouldn't typically see it in a very old person. You would typically see it in somebody who has a lot of estrogen and has had a lot of estrogen in their body for a couple decades. So people in their 40s, 50s, maybe into their 60s, it's more common, um, but uh, not so much in, uh, in younger adults. And if it's in very old people, it's usually something that's been there for a while or that probably started when they had more of these hormones. Are there any um, like ancient texts or historical texts that have documented cancer like illnesses, obviously, without knowing that they're cancer? But I mean, I don't know how they would do that without like, you know, examining a dead body. But like, I don't know, just out of curiosity, is there anything out there like that? There are definitely, I mean, people have known about cancer for a long time. People have been able to recognize cancer clinically for a long time, although often not until it became pretty, uh, pretty advanced. Um, 
but uh you know that they've uh uh, there are definitely some texts dealing with it. I'm trying to think of uh, of any good examples of them dealing with it successfully uh, other than by cutting it out, because a lot of the time that's what they would do is either cut or burn it away um, if it was something that could be reached. You know, if it was a deep abdominal cancer, then then a lot of the time they probably would not have diagnosed it. They probably would have not known what it was. But, uh, you know, if somebody had like breast cancer, for instance, uh, people have known what that was for a long time. Uh, and because it has, because it's palpable, you can feel it, you can see it. Uh, it, it looks different than other types of growth. It feels different too. If you know how to feel it, uh, it's kind of, it's harder. It's an immobile mass. It doesn't move so much with respect to the tissues around it. It's more like more firmly attached to the tissues immediately around it. And it tends to like draw things towards it. So a lot of the time that would result in like the nipple being inverted and there being a hard mass that's uh, that's not very movable around with the fingers and that, you know, grows and that leads to more sickness and things like that, uh, as opposed to just like a lump that maybe stays the same and is movable like a swollen lymph node or something like that. So people have known the difference between those things. Uh you know, they, they did in ancient Greek times and in, in, in uh, you know, classical antiquity, which is some a time period that I've read a lot of stuff from. Uh, probably they knew about it before that, too. It's just harder to find texts. And also, I'm not as good at reading them. Uh, I can't read ancient Egyptian or Sumerian, for instance. Um, but uh, so, yeah, people have known about it for a long time and they've had things that they've done about it for a long time. Um, but you know, some of that was, uh, cutting and burning and some of it was, uh, different herbs. And, uh, a lot of the time, the herbs that are recommended in the old texts, I haven't really seen so much good success with, uh, strangely enough. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what you're reading about in some of the things like that because the diagnostic criteria were different and not like obviously they didn't do biopsies or anything like that so it, it can be a little bit harder to um, to know exactly what they were dealing with but uh, some sometimes they were able to to get things to go away to get things to be better a lot of the time they did take extreme measures too though uh, like surgery. Um, so yeah, there, there's stuff like that out there. Uh, you know, we're, you know, cancer actually like means like crab, um, which people kind of visualize it as being like a crab that pinches and pulls with its, uh, various appendages. Um, because of the hardness of it and the the way that it sort of grips the stuff around it is why why they gave it that name. Just a second. I find cancer to be a very interesting topic. That's why I was asking about the historical text, just because I sometimes I wonder how much of our modern diet and modern environment attributes to the cancer cases that we see so often. And right. if we were to just go back and simply, you know, revert back to some older ways of living, would that reduce it? Obviously, it wouldn't eliminate it, but because some people are just going to be more susceptible to something like that. But I wonder right. about stuff like that a lot. Yeah, I, I do, too. And it can be very hard to sort that sort of thing out because, you know, like. Uh, uh yeah, that there were different challenges in different times of, of in terms of health, but uh, certainly within our time, uh, we've seen a lot of cancer 
that was from occupational exposure of various different types, for instance, that you wouldn't, you know, have expected to see in, in ancient times. Uh, people working with, well, Roundup is a, a recent example. Uh, you know, there's a class action lawsuit about Roundup causing cancer and people who have had cancer who were exposed to it occupationally. We don't know, you know, we can look at people who used it as their job and say, okay, lots of these people have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so there's a obvious connection there, or at least obvious enough to uh, win a class action suit. But with, you know, the amount of it being released into the environment in terms of lawn care and crop uh, management, has that resulted in an uptick in cancer in the general population? It's very hard to say. We can definitely say there's been an uptick in cancer in the general population, but it's kind of hard to say why. Um, they're of that type of cancer. Uh, there have also been things like uh, cigarette smoking, which was a very common uh, uh, hobby, no, habit, whatever you want to call it, a thing a lot of people did. Uh, 30 and 40 years ago that a lot fewer people do now. It's still common, but it's not like, I don't know if you can remember like in the 70s and 80s, you go, go to a doctor's office, they'd be sitting there smoking, you know, while they're doing a clinical interview. And uh, people at the gas station would be smoking on the job, wherever, you know, it was, it was just very pervasive. Um, teachers at school didn't smoke and maybe a few other places, but it was uh, just such a very common, very uh, socially accepted thing for people to do. Um, and then when people stopped doing it, you know, associated cancers did decline quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, something that uh, people, tobacco is something people had had for a long time but how people used tobacco changed very dramatically, you know, where it used to be more of a ceremonial thing that people would have a pipe that they would smoke occasionally and then went to cigarettes and people smoking, you know, a couple packs a day of cigarettes, which was probably not a rate of tobacco consumption that would have even been possible uh, in, in, in pre-industrial times uh, or at least it would have been difficult to manage. Um, so you, you see a lot of things like that with people's habits, people's changed lifestyles, changed diets, things like that. I think one of the reasons, I think one of the challenges as far as cancer goes in modern times is that like we used to eat a much more varied diet and now people eat the same foods year round and most of their foods come from a few different staple crops and livestocks and you know there there are things like uh for example pawpaws are getting ripe right now pawpaws contain some substances called acetogens that change the ph in cells we don't exactly know how this works with pawpaws or much of any other things but they cause some reactions chemical reactions that can kill cancer cells and people used to wait for the pawpaw harvest and then eat all the pawpaws they could find once a year. So they were giving themselves this big, uh, you know, uh, regular dose of a very mild chemotherapy, essentially. Um, and that was probably true of a lot of other substances, too, that are, are medicinal in ways that you don't even really think about when you're eating them. Um, that are maybe not so much part of the human diet or not so much part of the industrial uh, cultural diet. So, yeah, that's kind of uh, kind of an aside, but I definitely think that uh, there are some things about our lifestyle that do make cancer more challenging uh, or more common. And, you know, also part of that is probably that, uh, at least in a lot of places, people are living a bit longer and uh, that's uh, that's also makes you, the longer you live, the more likely you are to encounter a cancer in one of the years of your life. So, you know, that, that's a, that's a thing too. 
Although, you know, how much of a thing is very difficult to say. Do you think sugar plays a part too is a question? Yes, it seems to. It seems to. Sugar consumption probably does uh, play some role in in uh, the development of cancer. I think that some people exaggerate that. I mean, I've seen uh, a claim made and kind of that caught on a little bit in the natural health world for a while that uh, the cancer was just actually the body's way of trying to get rid of excess sugar. And that doesn't really pan out in any measurable way. Like, like people with cancer don't necessarily have dramatically high blood sugar and people with dramatically high blood sugar don't necessarily get cancer. But uh, you know, the, the idea was that the body is producing the cancer as sort of a last ditch effort to bring sugar in the body under control because cancer is an obligate consumer of sugar. If you uh, were to have consistently low blood sugar, it would be hard for cancer to get started in your body or to really get going in your body at least. Um, so the fact that we do have so much sugar and so much carbs in our diet compared to probably what our ancestors would have had in pre-agricultural times uh it probably probably does play some some kind of a role uh though you know with any sort of thing with epidemiology it's, it's very hard to work out causation because there are so many different variables coming into play so like you know with uh uh, with tuberculosis, you can tell what's causing tuberculosis because there's this bacteria there that isn't there when you don't have tuberculosis. But with something like cancer, there's nothing there except your own cells that have gone wrong. So we know that the cells going wrong has something to do with it, but exactly what causes that and doesn't cause it is uh, is a lot harder to sort out. Um so people who study carcinogens have worked out a system for, for that sort of thing where they have some things as known carcinogens, things like asbestos that were very sure cause cancer and do so fairly consistently. Then, then there's a category of probable carcinogens and then possible carcinogens and then things that we don't know uh, to, to, to be associated with it. So probable carcinogen is a somewhat controversial category because when something is a probable carcinogen, you usually have some people saying, oh, well, don't worry about it. We make this stuff and sell it and we're sure it's safe. And uh, it's only a probable carcinogen, not a known carcinogen. But really, if something rises to the level of probable in this system, there's a really good chance that it is a carcinogen. However, that being said, it's... Uh, not um that doesn't tell you how often it causes cancer so for instance red meat i think is classified either as a probable or as a known carcinogen it doesn't cause that many more cases of cancer it's not just red meat i think it's like uh maybe it's like some particular processing of the red meat um but uh, it doesn't cause like smoked meats or something like that are considered a, a known carcinogen, but they don't cause uh, a whole lot of new cases of carcin of cancer. So for every thousand people who are using them, you get one new case or something like that. Whereas cigarettes are also a known carcinogen and you get you know cancer in one out of five people who use them or something like that. And the rest die of heart disease. So, you know, even though they're both even though both of them have a similar level of evidence to make them sure that they cause some more cases of cancer, that doesn't tell you how frequently they cause or like how much they add to the risk, only how certain the people studying them are that they do add some amount of risk. I hope that makes sense. Is that, uh, uh, yes, it makes, makes total sense. sense. Uh, what what they're trying to say there, but uh, but you can look up uh, carcinogenicity of different substances, and they'll often be you know classified as known probable, meaning that there's like some consistent human data as well as some consistent laboratory 
testing like either with animals or with human tissue possible means that there's some either human tissue or laboratory animal testing but an insufficient amount of data beyond that to know whether it's whether it's causing cancer so there there are, you know those are basically the different levels of levels of certainty that there might be an added risk with this substance whatever it is uh and and you know don't confuse that for the level of risk it's just the level of certainty that some non-zero amount of risk exists So uh, yeah, varied diet and varied amounts and types of antioxidants, which generally speaking, we experience as the bright colors in fruits and vegetables. Uh, those tend to be things that help to maintain cellular integrity, as also is having good eliminative processes having kidneys and liver and colon working properly. Those things help to prevent cancer cells from forming and to prevent uh, neoplasms from building up. In other words, preventing irregular cells from becoming irregular tissues um, as, as they, they do in the case of cancer. Uh, but when somebody's already got it, those things aren't necessarily going to do a whole lot. Uh, they, might, they might keep things from getting worse, but they're not really likely to turn back the clock on things. Um, but if you keep things from getting worse and you stimulate the immune system to try and help get rid of what's already there, then you're working towards being able to make things better. I also use um, some herbs that are what people would call cytotoxic. Uh, these are poisonous herbs that are more poisonous to cancer cells than they are to general human body cells. And that's true of a lot of things because the cancer cells are, uh, they're more susceptible, just they're, they're kind of weak and fragile. They're not as well uh, hooked up to the body's plumbing. Uh, they are somewhat because they, they get the body to grow blood vessels into them, but they're usually not as, uh, as good at getting rid of uh, things that might disrupt them, uh, like toxic substances. And so uh, here are a couple of the ones that are um, kind of widely used in traditional Appalachian medicine. Uh, this one is poke root. Poke is a very, very common plant. Um, grows in everybody's yard. Uh, gather one poke root, you probably have more than you need for the year. And depending on the individual plant, the root can be sort of like carrot sized at the smallest or uh, I've seen one that was nearly the size of my leg. So the outside of the root looks kind of woody. It's got a thickish bark on it, but you can actually slice it with a knife. Uh, it's, it's not uh, that hard. It has a kind of, which is described, it has a unique smell to it that is kind of, um, kind of like a sharp scent, uh, sharp and earthy at the same time. Um, it's not extremely bitter the way that a lot of uh, alkaloid rich herbs are. Um, traditionally, poke is sometimes used topically. And if it is used topically on growths, it will sometimes make them shrink. Uh, if you take it internally, it will often cause a lot of diarrhea and dehydration. Uh, so if somebody does take it internally, they need to take it with a lot of fluids. And it's something that you would usually use in very small doses, like, uh, a dropper full, maybe, uh, 
sometimes a little more, sometimes less. Usually with these kinds of herbs, what I would do with them is give someone enough of them that it makes them increase the dose until the person feels a little bit sick and then scale back a little bit from there so that they so that you're at the highest dose that you can get to without the person feeling sick. So, um, and this, this would be the case with uh, poke root and with other herbs that might shrink tumors or kill cancer cells. Um, poke root, I tend to think more of as a shrinking type of thing, right? Like it doesn't necessarily eliminate cancer cells, but it does tend to make the growth smaller and less in the way. So sometimes you actually have uh, neoplasms growths that are impinging on other things that are making it so uh, the body isn't working because of their physical presence, because they're physically in the way. And so it is pretty helpful in that type of situation. This one is mayapple. Uh, mayapple is the underground stems of, uh, of the mayapple plant, which you, uh, if you've been on some of the herb walks, we've seen a few times. Uh, let's see. That's what it looks like. It's very plain, kind of smooth. Uh, when it dries, it dries to a very small thing. Uh, the tincture has a sort of yellowish color to it. It's possible to dry the tincture up and leave behind a crystal and yellowish substance, although that's too concentrated, in my opinion, to use for much. Uh, uh, this herb strongly stimulates the liver, so it often will result in somebody having a stool with a lot of greenish bile in it. Uh, if you're getting that kind of reaction, that's a little bit too much and you would want to scale back from there. Um, it does uh, something to cells. It, it, it alkylates cells. So when it gets inside of a cancer cell, it has, it releases, um, I guess you could call it a sort of a free radical, um, something that uh, an unstable molecule that attaches itself to molecules in the cell and changes them. And uh, in uh, probably it's changing the DNA inside of them, and, and but it's causing the cells to collapse. It's causing the cells to die. And that's the important part. So we could call it a cytotoxic or we could call it an alkylating agent, but it's something that kills cells and especially the irregular cells which um <clears throat> are less well protected than than the normal cells of the body so it does help with uh weakening cancer cells making it easier for the body to get rid of them and so that is uh, a strategy that i have used uh, a substance that i've used sometimes it is definitely um not uh um well it's it's strong medicine it's strong medicine it's not something you would want to use lightly it's not something you would want to use without a lot of forethought but it is something that is sometimes helpful in getting rid of uh uh neoplasms um growths things like that if it's something topical like it's on the skin it, it will disrupt them you can put it on warts it will burn them right up the skin uh, just cause them to crumble. It doesn't like actually feel like it's burning, but it causes them to crumble. Um, if you use it on, uh, I have sometimes use it with blood root on um, lesions on the skin and it will uh, attach itself to the irregular cells and make them uh, too alkaline to function, make them uh, too disrupted to be able to make more of themselves. So that is uh, another herb that is, uh, like I said, it's a traditional herb for this purpose here in Kentucky. Uh, not necessarily a great uh, beginner level herb to use even for this type of situation, but it, but it can, uh, it has been and can be uh, used with some reasonably good effect sometimes. Uh, in a person whose body is healthy enough to handle it. Yeah, the underground stems of mayapple. I mean, you, you, 
people sometimes would call it the root, but it's really is really a rhizome. It's really an underground stem, and then the roots come down from it and are very small. But uh, yeah, it is technically the underground stem, and it looks a lot like the above ground stem, but it's covered in a dark brownish bark. Instead Would you say using may apple um, internally for a cancer patient would be too harsh to use alongside like chemotherapy or something like that? Maybe. It does increase nausea. It does increase okay. somebody's tendency to be nauseous. So that's something to be aware of. I think that there is a dose at which it would not be too harsh. And that a lot of the time it's about finding that dose because with just about anything, the dose makes the poison, you know, the, uh, uh, and also the medicine. So just trying to find the right dose of it where the person is able to tolerate it is, uh, is a lot of the, um, is a lot of the skill, is a lot of what you need to be able to do to make it, uh, useful. What would be a proper starting dosage, just the smallest amount possible to work from on both of these really probably like one milliliter i don't okay. think that less than that would be likely to do much but sometimes that's a sufficient dose sometimes that's a uh, uh, all you need so or all that the person's going to tolerate very well so yeah that that might be a good dose to start with especially if the person's system is sensitive or if they've got a lot else going on health-wise you know, like that's a tincture. Well. Yeah, that's a tincture. Okay. And let's see. So that's one strategy is basically poisoning the cancer tissue with things that are going to disrupt its metabolism. Another thing that people sometimes do when using uh, herbs to help the body fight off cancer uh is that some herbs like red clover um tend to decrease the ability of the uh of the neoplasma of the tissue to get blood cells to grow into it so the cells whenever your body is growing new tissue it tends to grow blood vessels into that tissue to feed and nurture it and Cancer gets that to happen, even though it's not really functioning as part of your body. Uh, so red clover and also some other isoflavone containing herbs uh, like soy will sometimes help to uh, keep that process from happening so that as the cells develop, they're not getting fed. They're not getting nurtured because there's not new blood vessels being built into them. And in that case, Um, the cells just kind of die. This is called apoptosis. It's just like the cells, instead of continuing to replicate, they reach the end of their life and then they die and they're not replaced. And so that, if you can get that to happen, that's a really positive thing. Um, so uh, red clover is the herb that is kind of my go-to for that. It's uh, you know also traditional in some of the, um, multi-ingredient uh, cancer remedies like the Hoxy formula, but uh, it, it has a longer history than that of, of use, and it has some at least uh, preliminary scientific data to support its use. Um, I like uh, sprouted red clover. I actually get red clover seeds and sprout them and then make a tincture out of the sprouts. Um, and that has actually a lot more of the relevant isoflavones in it than the mature red clover plant has. So. No, not really for a specific type of cancer, just for the specific strategy of trying to get the body not to build blood cells into the cancer. Um, so that's uh that's something that uh um that that's you know maybe it can be hard to tell if it's helpful 
but it's something that, that I would do to try and encourage the cancer not to spread, encourage the body to not have the cancer spread. Um, Excuse me, but how would you make that tincture with the sprouts? Would they be fresh then? Yeah, I would make it with fresh sprouts, you know, two to one, uh, 50% alcohol tincture. Thank so you. the sprouts contain a lot of water themselves, but uh, um, yeah, I, I just get, I, you can get red clover seeds for sprouting. Um, I get mine through Frontier uh, Co-op and then sprout them in a jar just by rinsing them every day usually takes about three days before they start sprouting i usually go one or two more days after they've started sprouting and uh, just keep rinsing them with water and pouring the water off once a day and uh and then make a tincture out of them and uh that's um a good strong source of, of uh clover isoflavones or it's uh, probably about 10 times as much of them as there would be in the mature, uh, the flowers from the mature plant. And these are substances that are kind of like estrogens. So using them on an estrogen sensitive cancer is probably not a good idea. Um, so, you know, some breast cancers, especially and ovarian cancers generally um, are estrogen sensitive they're fed by estrogen they react to estrogen um and estrogen makes helps them grow uh so in those situations i would avoid that one and instead of that i might use um sarsaparilla uh smilax uh which is uh a different herb that has some uh i mean it has different properties different chemicals but might uh, also help to prevent uh, the growth of new blood cells into into cancer tissue. What was the ratio of the sprouts to alcohol again? I, you couldn't broke up on my end. Sorry. Two parts alcohol to one part sprout. Uh, two liters of alcohol to uh, one kilogram of sprout. Okay, so besides directly working on the cancer cells with things that poison the cancer or uh, keep it from being able to grow or get the immune system to uh, to act against it. Uh, oh, well, I did want to say something else about that. Warming the area that the cancer is in uh, with MOXA is sometimes helpful. 
Um, also, garlic is a traditional thing that it's not going to kill cancer by itself, but it might take some of the burden off of the immune system by uh, decreasing the amount of bacteria that are in the system. And it also might increase the circulation in a way that's helpful to getting rid of the cancer cells uh, that helps the immune system to uh, to respond to the cancer cells. And so that's uh, that's another thing that is, you know, simple and familiar enough that a lot of people will work with it that is uh that is sometimes a good adjunctive treatment it's not something that is directly anti-cancer but it helps the body's own anti-cancer faculties to be more um more robust and to have a more of an advantage as far as the terrain of the human body goes so doing all, all of those things is useful and helpful and increases somebody's chances of having a good outcome. But a lot of the time when people have cancer, they want help with some very day-to-day -day things that, uh, that might be more what your focus ends up being as you're working with them, especially if they're already doing a pretty grueling uh, regimen of, of uh, conventional treatments. Uh, and so some of the things that people often really need help with are appetite, pain, and sleep. Uh, pain and sleep kind of go together because pain keeps people from sleeping. But even when people aren't in any pain, sometimes they have a lot of trouble with sleeping, with being able to sleep. And there are a number of reasons for that, uh, psychological and physiological. So um, I want to talk about appetite and nausea first because it's a familiar well-known thing about cancer and uh, about cancer treatment is that a lot of people lose their appetites completely and a lot of people really actually enter into malnourishment and starvation in that situation and so that is often one of the reasons people stop treatment for cancer is because they're no longer able to nourish themselves, so they're no longer able to continue with the treatment. And if you can keep someone from getting into that state, sometimes that can make all the difference in whether they are able to uh, go through with treatment, go through with conventional treatment, um, and whether they are able to live long enough to get better. Uh, so it's a, it's a very vital, part of the process. Um, cannabis is something that is familiar to a lot of people that a lot of people have used before and are, you know, fam uh, familiar enough with that they'd be willing to try it. Um, <clears throat> it is uh, generally something that increases people's appetite at first, but you don't necessarily get sustained uh relief from that it helps with all of the things that i just mentioned actually pain sleep and appetite but it a lot of the time people find that it helps a lot with those things at first and then less and less as time goes on so um it's not something that i tend to rely on a whole lot for any of those things although you know it's it's good to know that it's a possibility um it's, uh, you know, depending on where you are, maybe legal, maybe illegal. Here in Kentucky, I think it's been made legal for medical purposes, but exactly what that means in practical terms, I haven't really seen yet. But uh, it's, um, it's something that, you know, like I said, most people have used before, most people are familiar with, and uh, uh, a lot of people will already be using by the time they come to see you too. Uh, so that's something to know about that is sometimes helpful. Um, besides that, uh, ginger is a well-known thing for uh, nausea. And a lot of the time it is help helpful. Uh, it's warming to the stomach. So a lot of the time people have a cold, sick feeling in the pit of their stomach. So ginger being warm can help with that. 
if you add a little bit of the kind of cayenne to the ginger, sometimes it's even more helpful, but you want to do enough of it that it doesn't feel extremely hot. Just, you know, maybe like you have a, a little bit of cayenne tincture and you put a drop of cayenne tincture in a cup of ginger tea, for instance. I'll often give people uh, ginger syrup in this situation or a ginger, a concentrated liquid extract of ginger that uh, is going to, uh, and the ginger syrup I use doesn't really contain a lot of sugar. It contains some starches from the ginger itself, but it's basically just kind of uh, ginger juice that's been cooked down a little bit. Um, and I also use ginger tincture, which is not as concentrated, but, but might be a little more easy for people to take sometimes. Uh, but any of those things, the warming feeling in the stomach is a big part of how it works. Um, so th that can be really helpful. Bitters after a meal can be really, really helpful. So uh, some bitter herbs, like a few drops of gentian or um, sometimes, uh, sometimes I use bone set as a bitter. Um, a, a few drops of that or, or licorice and bone set together or licorice and gentian together. Uh, also aloe in very small amounts, but just a few drops of bitter after a meal can sometimes really help people to not have a persistent sense of heaviness in their stomach after they've eaten. Constipation causes nausea as well. So making sure that the person does not have constipation is a really uh, necessary part of this calculation. Uh, you can give somebody any medicine in the world for nausea, but if their bowels are not able to move things down, things are going to want to come back up. So, uh, you know, that that's uh, really kind of fundamental, foundational, uh, necessary, but not always sufficient for treating nausea to have uh, the person not be constipated. Um, so that's really important. The other thing that's really helpful and really important in this situation is nutrient dense food. And so sometimes people with cancer, they want to be eating healthy. They wanna, you know, uh, eat things like fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. And sometimes they're able to if they don't have any nausea but if somebody is struggling with nausea they really need to stick to nutrient dense things things like uh fats and oils and proteins um that are going to give them a lot of calories per amount of heaviness in their stomach um i have sometimes made people a mixture of honey and coconut oil to take uh, a large spoonful of it can contain a couple hundred calories, uh, which is not uh, not all you need for the day or anything, but it's a, a significant chunk of it. It's like, you know, the calories you might get from a small meal of, of, uh, of fruit and vegetables in, in one spoonful and basically one swallow. And so that's, uh, you know, getting that kind of nutrient dense uh, energy into their body because uh, protein and energy are, you know, if you'll recall when we talked about uh, macronutrients so long ago last year, uh, protein and calories are the main, are the, the two most fundamental things without which nothing else is really going to work the way it's supposed to. So uh, trying to get the protein and calories first, if that's all you can get, is important. You know, trying to get everything else is, is extra, and you can do that when things are working well. But when somebody is uh, struggling with terrible nausea, if you can give them a spoonful of food that has a couple hundred calories, that can uh, really make a huge difference to uh, how they're going to feel the rest of that day and even to whether their body is going to have the energy to digest food. Because a lot of the time what happens is that people go downhill and get to a point where their body no longer has the energy to digest food and to eliminate waste products. And at that point, it's very hard to turn things around. Um, 
because you know they can't nurture themselves they can't they can't nourish themselves and they can't get better without being nourished so uh Fish is a really nutrient dense food that often does not feel very heavy to people, uh, especially cod or salmon. These are things that a lot of people can digest well. Some people aren't used to eating them and they're probably not going to suddenly develop the taste for them. Um, but if somebody can eat a few ounces of food rather than just a spoonful of food, uh, that can be a good way to get a lot of protein and fat into their body is cold water fish like uh like salmon and or uh, uh cod that are going to have fats fish oils uh as well as proteins and for whatever reason often don't feel as heavy in the stomach as uh something like beef or pork or chicken which i think is probably a textural thing rather than a actual nutritional content thing nut butters also lots of protein lots of fat usually uh, a good choice for somebody who's able to eat a, a limited amount of uh, a limited amount of weight a limited amount of substance Moxa can be really helpful, both for uh, the points for nausea, like this point here that I showed you before uh, on the inside of the elbow. That can be really helpful for nausea. Um, moxa on the floating ribs, the lower ribs, uh, the points of the floating ribs can help to move the bowels. Uh, and that can be really helpful for, for constipation, which in turn can be helpful for nausea and appetite. So that's a really useful thing. Um, so all of those can be really important for, for appetite. Um, licorice is sometimes helpful uh, in, just, in terms of being just like, not a really strong bitter, but just something that's mild and can increase uh, the amount of digestive juices. Uh, licorice is good, burdock is also good. These are things that just might might be able to uh, help the digestive system to be a little bit stronger and healthier and help people not to feel so uh, nauseous or sluggish in their digestion, not to have as much stagnation in their digestive system. Um, to hearken back to another early uh, class topic. Just a second. All right. Uh, let's see. Andrew, I had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's fine. What's that? You, you, you mentioned a point at the floating ribs that helps with constipation. Mm -hmm. um, can you, like, point to those for me? Because I don't remember those. <laughs> so the floating ribs are just kind of, like, at the bottom of the rib cage. And uh, it'd be on the side here. Kind of like okay. feel where the main part of the rib cage is, and then just below it, there's like a rib that sticks out that's not attached to the others. And just at the tip of that rib uh, is a point okay. that uh, that doing mux on that helps to get the intestines to move, get peristalsis to happen. So thank you. Um, yeah. So sleep is another huge issue. And if somebody's not sleeping, they're probably not going to have an appetite either. Sometimes this is just about stress. Being extremely sick is probably probably the most stressful thing in the world. Um, or if it's not, it's 
definitely, definitely in the top five, you know, kind of would depend on the individual person and how they take things. But uh, being mortally ill is, uh, is really, really stressful. So that by itself often makes people feel like they can't sleep, makes people, you know, their minds racing, they're thinking about what's going on with them, what's going to happen to their family if they don't survive, and so on. So that can make it really, really difficult for somebody to rest. In addition to that, a lot of the time when people are getting chemo treatments, they are often given steroids to keep their response to the chemo treatment from being as bad. Uh, steroids make it very hard for people to sleep. Uh, pain makes it very hard for people to sleep. And a lot of cancers and some cancer treatments result in a significant amount of pain. So um, being able, I'm going to deal with pain as its own separate thing, but being able to deal with these things and get sleep is very vital to healing, very vital to just having the best possible chance of a positive outcome that you could have. Um, one of the herbs that I like for this scenario specifically is motherwort. It's motherwort is something I use a lot in my practice in general, but uh, trying to get somebody to sleep while they're stressed is uh, is something that is particularly good at. It's a heart herb, so. It helps to soothe the heart, calm the speed of the heartbeat. It also is a nerve herb, so it helps to put the nervous system to sleep. Sometimes I combine it with chamomile. That's both of them right here. I used them earlier today, not for cancer, but for someone else who needed sleep. Um, so the two of those things together, uh, usually I would, sometimes I use motherwort by itself, sometimes motherwort and chamomile. I would use chamomile by itself if it was not very bad, but just a little bit, not what it should be. But motherwort is something that will like uh, kind of, it won't override all all of someone's tendencies to stay awake, but it does definitely uh, outweigh a lot of other things in terms of putting somebody to sleep. They can go to sleep even though they're in pain. They can go to sleep even though they're very worried um, and they can get often a very normal night's sleep. Uh, so, you know, giving, giving somebody uh, uh, motherwort or motherwort and chamomile can be a really helpful thing. Um, Hops is helpful sometimes for some people. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of people will try cannabis, uh, which helps some people. It helps a lot of people at first, and then a lot of the time it kind of gets a little bit less helpful. And that sometimes is, is in the form of medicinal marijuana. Sometimes it's more like CBD oil or whatever, but, uh, but the same thing applies, that it, it tends to be uh, very strong at first, but not always something that uh, stays strong or that sometimes people have to do in order for it to be effective after the beginning. Uh, uh, sometimes people have to do it at a level that makes it harder for them to, to be awake and alert and stuff when they are awake. And so sometimes that doesn't feel very good to people. And sometimes people actually get a lot more nauseous if they're using a lot of it. Um, and so that can be a really... Uh, good reason for people to stop it as well. Uh, but motherwort, I haven't really seen any kind of, uh, the only, pe people do get groggy on it, especially if someone goes to sleep using it and then has to wake up for some reason. It can be hard for them to wake up, but it, it wears off in about six or eight hours and then, then it's not, uh, you know, it's not usually going to make the person feel groggy the next day um, or out of energy the next day. Cause that's something that a lot of people who are going through treatment for cancer struggle with is that they've still got a life going on and they might not have the energy to do things like, uh, take care of their family or, you know, if they're trying to, sometimes people want to try and go visit somebody or something like that. Uh, if they think they might not live, um, and sometimes, you know, the exhaustion can make it impossible for people to, to go through with things like that. 
So motherwort is usually pretty helpful in terms of being able to make people feel able to sleep and then not make them feel groggy uh, once they've woken up uh, or, you know, six or eight hours later. If they, if they wake up soon, then maybe they'll feel really groggy, but uh, not if they get a good night's sleep. All the other sleep herbs, skull cap, uh, passion flower, uh, those, those are still sometimes useful in some people. The mother word isn't as good. And so I might try one of those instead, but the mother word is my first line thing that I would try in trying to produce sleep in somebody that has a very severe illness. Um, Valerian and chamomile is a thing that I have used sometimes. Valerian doesn't produce a very normal sleep state. Chamomile usually does. Combining them together sometimes gets people to sleep who are having a hard time getting to sleep otherwise. Uh, so that's um, definitely something that I've used at times. Uh, but uh, like I said, the, the motherwort's kind of the first line thing and the other things are more like things I might try if the motherwort doesn't work. Now, pain, as always, is uh, potentially a big issue. Uh, we have many, uh, well, a lot of cancers cause pain just by themselves. And then, of course, if somebody has had surgery, if they've had radiation treatments, they're often going to have pain from those things as well. Um, so some, some people in can with cancer are in an extraordinary amount of pain. A lot of the time they'll be trying to manage those things with conventional uh, pain medicines as well. Um, so, and that can contribute to the nausea and the uh, constipation and things like that if they're using conventional pain medicines. Um, so some of the things I use for, for this situation, I tend not to try and use anti-inflammatory pain medicines. In most situations, if somebody's in pain, I will use anti-inflammatory things. Um, but when somebody has cancer, there's a few things going on. One is that the inflammation is actually a vital part of the body's own response to the cancer. And you don't necessarily want that not to be happening. Uh, you don't want to decrease inflammation in a way that reduces immune response. And so the, uh, the cells of the cancer producing inflammation is one of the ways that the immune system is going to be able to find them and, and deal with them. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of cancer drugs already have the problem of thinning and weakening the blood vessels and causing extravasation, which is like where people bruise without there being a real reason to. And some anti-inflammatory herbs uh, like wintergreen, which I use a lot, would, would potentially make that worse. So uh, usually in people with cancer, I'm trying to uh, reduce pain without reducing inflammation. Um, Sometimes it's necessary to reduce inflammation if, if there's just a significant amount of it that's causing its own problems, like if somebody's got a really swollen joint or something. But for the most part, I want to deal with the pain in a simple pain relieving way that is not, uh, not about inflammation. So a lot of the, the substances that do that are also, uh, can also cause drowsiness. Um, Wild lettuce is one of the milder ones that I use. Uh, it is, um, you know, like I've talked about it before with you, it's uh, it's not really, some people think of it as being like an opiate because it, it's a latex and it's bitter and it's pain relieving and causes drowsiness, but it's actually in some ways closer to chamomile than it is to opium. Um, actually, in a lot of ways, it's closer to chamomile chemically and in terms of the physiology of the plant itself.
Uh, so uh, wild lettuce is something that, that I might use if there was not a lot of pain. Um, if there was more pain, is Schultzia or, um, well, California poppy or wood poppy are both things that I might use in that situation. These again, these are actually, you know, they're in the, they're in the poppy family. So they are also sedating and they are also, uh, pain relieving. Uh, I don't tend to want to use those along with conventional pain meds because it's too much of the same thing, possibly. So that's something that I might use in some situations, though, as, as a way of relieving pain. Another thing that I use um, that is not really an herb of commerce, but is a traditional medicinal from here in Kentucky, is an herb called canophilus, which is also called cancer root. It's not really a root. It doesn't, it's really a, it's a weird plant. It doesn't have leaves. Uh, it doesn't have chlorophyll. It's a parasitic plant that grows on the roots of oak trees, uh, grows from the roots of oak trees and, you know, emerges from the ground near them. Uh, if you were with us on the herb walks in uh, Garrett County, you may have seen it. Um, but anyway, it's a weird yellow plant that doesn't have any chlorophyll in it and doesn't have any leaves and it makes a very purple tincture and uh here i'll be gonna write the name of it down it's called cancer root um canophilus is its latin name Anopheles Americana, and it is uh, specifically something that I use for pain in cancer people, in people who have cancer. It's a, it's a good pain reliever. It works on deep pain, bone pain, things like that. It's not an anti-inflammatory, and it produces very little drowsiness. Um, Although, you know, in some people who are very depleted, relieving pain can make them sleep for 18 hours because they've been not getting any sleep. But it, in a person who is not very depleted, it doesn't cause drowsiness. Um, so it's probably more that it just allows people to finally relax than that it's actually causing drowsiness in the usual sense of the term. So that is uh, Canophilus. And it's a it's something that is ecologically sensitive that does have to be gathered with care. When you find it growing, what you're seeing is just the flowering part of the plant because that's really all there is. Like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't have leaves. It doesn't photosynthesize. It's, uh, it's pollinated by flies and it grows under oak trees. And uh, if you find it, you'll usually find a little cluster of these flowering parts of it. And you can just snip one member from each cluster or from every few clusters and leave the other parts of it still there. So it's like you're just snipping the flowers off and not pulling up the plant. Don't, don't yank it up out of the ground. Just snip it off with a knife or scissors or something of that sort so that, that is allowed to continue growing. You are reducing the number of seeds that get dispersed from it but you're not killing the plant. Um, so that is something that, like I said, is not an herb of commerce. It's not something that you can easily, you know, order a pound of from wherever. Uh, it's something you pretty much have to go out into the woods to get in my experience, although there's probably someone out there making and selling tincture of it. I would never buy this from someone else just because it is a completely wild, ecologically sensitive plant it does grow on mature oak trees so you need a forest with mature oak trees before you have really any hope of finding any of it um so here in central kentucky those would be out in the woods on top of the ridges where the oak trees and uh other nut trees are would be the place to look for it if you're going to look for it and uh it's a, it's an unusual plant. 
but uh, it's just really helpful for this particular application. Is that your garlic behind you? This is garlic, yeah. That's aged garlic, uh, which does not taste real garlicky uh, and is not as good for killing bacteria, but it is just as good for lowering blood pressure and is perhaps easier for a lot of people to take because it doesn't taste real garlicky. It's pretty. It's pretty, yes. I like it too. So let's see what else do we have. So in addition to all of that, uh, another category of herbs that is really helpful is uh, things that help the body to cope with the stress of treatment. So for this, this would include, um, one of my favorites in this category is Tulsi, uh, holy basil, because it's very well tolerated and it's uplifting. It helps people to have a more positive attitude, um, helps people not to feel hopeless, uh, which can be really important in this type of situation. And, uh, you know, it's incredibly well tolerated. There are some other herbs like rhodiola or eleuthero that are also helpful in terms of people keeping their energy up um, and uh, helping their body not to be as physiologically affected by the psychological stress of being very ill. Uh, and th those can be really helpful things for somebody to have too. Um, there are cases where uh, herbs like that might result in someone producing more androgens. So if it were an androgen sensitive cancer like testicular cancer, it's probably better not to take the eleuthero or the rhodiola, but it might be uh, the, the Tulsi is still pretty good. Like I said, it's very well tolerated and it doesn't really tend to have a direct, it does seem to have an effect on cortisol production, but it doesn't seem to have much of an effect on like the uh, sex steroids, uh, things like estrogen and androgens and stuff like that. So uh, all of those can be useful in, uh, in different scenarios. But like I said, this is just kind of to give you a general overview of what sort of things you might do for somebody, what sort of things you might focus on for somebody with, uh, with cancer if they came to you for help. And if you do find yourself in that situation, I definitely thoroughly uh, recommend reaching out to me and, and I will do what I can to help you to help them um, because it, it can be, you know, a complicated and multifaceted process. Uh, because it is an uh, uh, illness process that involves a lot of different structures and functions in the body, as well as interfacing with a lot of different social and cultural and uh, life in general types, types of uh, challenges. So, you know, it's uh, uh, hopefully the information that I've given you today is a a good starting off point to uh, to learn more about it. Um, there are some decent books uh, out there about uh, herbs for cancer, and there are also some really terrible ones. Um, there's a herbalist called Donald Yance who has written some decent stuff. Uh, he tends to be pretty careful about what claims he makes and what he, you know, what, what uh, how he manages people's expectations. Uh, there are other things out there that are very, uh, anybody who's out there saying that, you know, that they've got it all figured out, you shouldn't listen to them. Uh, if it's, you know, the cure for all cancers, for instance, uh, terrible. Uh, not only, not only wrong, but uh, sort of very, 
unscrupulously peddling uh, false promises. And uh, I hate that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, humility and being able to uh, take a big look at the big picture is really important when it comes to dealing with any sort of serious health challenges. So any questions about any of that? All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. And I will talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Good night.